Joe, so uh, introduce yourself to our audience tonight. Well, first of all, Brian, I just want to say thank you so much for inviting me to this conversation. I'm really glad that uh, we can have it and I'm excited to see where it goes. Um, for those people at home, I'm Joe Town. Actually, you don't have to be at home. <laughs> you can be anywhere <laughs> listening to this. Uh, I just have been home so much. Anyway, my name is Joe Town. Uh, I love stargazing and making chicken parmesan. But seriously, I'm an actor and I'm a storyteller in front of and behind the camera. I have been for the last 30 years. Um, a few years back, I started a company which helped bring together several of my passions. One of them being the intersection of art and sport. Second, understanding things that, that felt like magic, but through the lens of science. And the third thing is really helping others do better and feel better. So it's the short, short version, but anybody sure. else know anything else or if you want to know anything else i'm happy to do more of a deep dive well what inspired you to go into a career in performing what any uh, personal inspirations from individuals or, or what inspired you yeah i mean i think uh monopoly or playing baseball for the yankees were probably one and two for me growing <laughs> up but uh i didn't think that you could actually get paid to play monopoly and um my eyesight changed and i became afraid of the high inside fastball so there was this moment for me where I fell in love with acting at a time that I had no confidence and it gave me a path and it gave me a purpose. And uh, I happened to be at a high school that valued the arts and my teacher really became a friend and became a mentor and really helped me like process big questions I was wrestling with. This was all in high school. I had wanted to try out for plays in middle school, and I, I think I chickened out, if I'm being honest. And um, the high school is that put on several plays a year. I was invited down in the first play of my freshman year, and I worked backstage till I sort of felt like I understood what was happening. And I ended up getting cast as like the offstage voiceover role, and um, sort of fell in love with it. You know, and two years later, I ended up going off to an acting camp called Stage Door Manor. It was a big acting camp that people traveled to from all over the place, all over the States, all over Canada. But there, all of a sudden, I'm not just with people in my hometown, you know, and uh, I'm in a group of some of the most talented young performers around the country. And while I was there, I got to audition for a Broadway show. And all the kids in a certain age bracket, they were looking for two boys to play two roles in a new Neil Simon play. It's called Lost in Yonkers. And it was the first time it was ever going to be on Broadway. And I got past the first round into the second round and past the second round into the third round. And this was the, the sort of final audition before you were going to go to New York City and meet the whole creative team. And I finished and I was having fun. And the casting director called me over and said, listen, no way in hell I can cast you as a Jew in the 1940s but you should keep doing this. And I was like, okay. Like I didn't really have any attachment to it. I didn't really have any expectations, but there was something that got sparked in that where all of a sudden I thought, hmm, maybe, maybe there's something here beyond just something fun I like to do in high school. Ironically enough, when I got back to high school, the very first play that I did was The Diary of Anne Frank. And I was cast as a young boy, Peter Van Dam was, Anne Frank's boyfriend during the Holocaust and uh, was a Jew in the 1940s. So it was kind of funny that that was the one thing he said I probably wouldn't be cast as. So now throughout all your career of maybe interacting and training with different actors and actresses, has there been a single actor or actress that you've worked with that has had a profound impact on maybe you from a professional standpoint or even as an individual standpoint? No, it's such a good question. I, I'm really... I feel like every job I've been fortunate to have, even the, the near miss ones, I've really been fortunate to learn something along the way. And I was thinking about this, the most recent project that I got to do pre COVID times was a, a studio feature called, isn't it romantic? And I got to work with Rebel Wilson, who I always enjoyed. I always thought she was so funny and charming and uh here i was getting to get to play with her for the day and 
what ended up on screen wasn't the largest role in the world, but, but for the few hours that we got to work together, I really appreciated so many things from her. First of all, she had to wear this dress that she'd been wearing throughout the feature. And it was really tight. It was something that was, we were shooting in New York City in the summertime, it was August. And it was maybe like 100 degrees outside. And she'd been already working all day. I mean, already working for hours and hours, doing these stunt falls, you know, working with a stunt choreographer, falling to the ground repeatedly, repeatedly, repeatedly. And here she was about to walk down a whole flight of subway steps and then do uh, basically like four scenes back to back to back all without stopping. And so it was like however many minutes of material and four different scenes with four different people and and 50 extras and every time we reset they had to reset everybody and so just admiring her work ethic alone and her ability to stay in that and be able to perform at a high level make it look spontaneous be gracious with the people she was working with that alone was inspiring and the process we got to do together you know i i, I spoke to one of the producers before we started and i was like how does she like to work does she like to make things up as she goes? Does she like to do it as written? And he said, you know, she always likes to do exactly as it's written on the page at first. And after a couple of goes, if she gets the sense that maybe you can hang or play, you know, maybe she will say something. And I was like, great. It sounds, sounds like a plan. So we did it a couple times. Super fun. And in between the third one, she had this look in her eye and she called me over and she's like, okay, on this next one, let's try this. And then you can do this. And I was like, all right, we're, we're collaborating. <laughs> <laughs> and she was so um, smart and so playful. And through these wrinkles, you know, during the, the opportunity to, to collaborate. And then she did the same stuff when it was on my footage. She didn't disappear and have the script reader just reading with me. She was right there with me, throwing new stuff out, coming up with ideas and that sense of um, discipline and that sense of play together is incredibly inspiring to me. Now, obviously your, your profession is a very competitive one. And so you're going to meet a lot of different people who may aspire to be like you, to take your role, take your job, whatever it may be. How difficult is it to kind of balance the competitive side of you with also like the professional side of you or for example, maybe you wanting to uplift others and try to help them along, maybe a younger actor, for example. How difficult is it to balance the competitiveness, the mentorship, all in one big role? Yeah, it's such a good question. That what, what place does competition have in the arts and in also your desire to help other people? And, um, you know, I, I grew up in a somewhat competitive environment. Both my dads, my dad and my stepdad were very competitive with me. And so, you know, the idea of trying to beat them at baseball or chess or whatever we were doing, darts, you know, uh, tackling them. I always, I always had that fire there. And I think it's interesting because it came from sport. And so then all of a sudden, the, the plays that we were doing in high school, we auditioned in an interesting way. And what I mean by that is, we didn't wait outside and come in one at a time. We all sat in the auditorium together and watched each other go. So I was watching everyone and I'd come up with an idea and say, okay, that person did that and that person did that and that person did that. I'm going to do this. And so there was this sense of like, I can't wait to show this new idea to people. And so the idea of competing has really toggled back and forth between two different perspectives in my life. I imagine that most of us listening to this or in our conversation, that the definition of competition probably comes from the definition that the French have, which is compter, which means to like best your opponent. And most of us, that's our understanding of what competition actually is. But it was learning from an amazing author and coach and on-air host, a guy named Yogi Roth, who helped write the book Win Forever with Coach Carroll. And he introduced me to a different definition of competition that has never left my side. So apparently the Latin definition of competition meant to strive together, 
to strive together toward a common goal, to strive together toward a common goal, to be the best version of myself. And as soon as I heard that, that helped me make sense of my competitive fire, but also my desire to help others because we're all in this together. And as soon as I realized that my old way of thinking was really scarcity based, only one person can get this role. And as a result, that makes me want to elbow out the person to my left, person to my right. But ultimately, I know now that there are certain jobs that are not for me. I didn't know that at the time. But later on, I came to realize like why they weren't for me, why I wasn't ready for them, why there was another opportunity waiting. Uh, I did a play in college. And I went to USC. I'm obviously representing because today's National Signing Day. And uh, we did this play called the Star Wars Trilogy on stage in half an hour. Star Wars Trilogy in 30 minutes. And we developed it at the School of Drama. And uh, George Lucas actually sanctioned us to do it. And we ended up going off and performing it all over the place. Uh, conventions and up at his Skywalker Ranch and over in Europe. And one of the most fun opportunities I've ever been a part of. And so I got a call from the creator of that show, a guy named Patrick Gorman. And he said, hey, we're going to get to go to Skywalker Ranch. And I had just booked a huge role, my first TV role in New York City after college. And it was to be on Law and Order, Criminal Intent with this actor named Vincent D'Onofrio, this guy I sort of admired and I couldn't wait to finally have a credit. It had been a while since I worked and I had to turn down the job because I didn't want to let down my castmates. They couldn't replace me by the next week, I didn't think, and I didn't think it was fair to them. And so I went off and I did the play. And I had a blast. I got to meet my mentor. Um, we had an amazing time. And when I got back to New York City, I, I think I flew overnight or something, and I had an audition the day I got back for a, a show. And I ended up booking that play and I ended up getting my equity card, which is like the union for being in plays as opposed to the union for radio artists or, or TV and film. And I wouldn't have known that before that decision. I wouldn't have known that that was going to be the result. But there was something that felt in retrospect, like I was meant to be on that path. And so, you know, sometimes we don't know in advance why we do the things we do. Well, which kind of... Yeah, absolutely. And then that, that translates next to my next question, which talks about the performer's mindset, which is now you're kind of in a, a role where you are sort of mentoring and coaching that next generation of athletes, performers, you have it. And you're focusing mostly on the mental side of the equation, which is a little bit different than what we see in this industry from the day-to-day -day perspective. So why the emphasis on the mental component? What, what motivated you to focus on that? You know, there, there are only so, uh, there's only so much that our craft, our technique can do to help us build confidence and go perform. And there are a lot of great teachers out there that are helping us with our craft. But I noticed as a coach that at the last minute, right before somebody was about to go and perform, there was one thing that could either bring all of their hard work to life or send it completely off the rails. And that was their mind. The thoughts that they were thinking as they launched into it either set them up to be tense and anxious and nervous or worried about something they couldn't control or it seemed to unlock all of this hard work and potential and, and this state of flow. And so I got really curious what was happening there. And fortunately, it was really sport, sports psychology and sports science that helped me understand a little bit about what was happening and so as I did a deep dive, I started applying it to my own auditions. And then I started peppering it into my classes. And then with a colleague, we created a, a one-off program that was designed to use sports psychology and sports science to help actors deal with everything from nerves to head noise and all that. And it took off from there. I mean, it really was that, that curiosity that led to the rest. And, you know, it felt like that was something that, wasn't really being talked about at great length. So that's where it came from. So when you get a performer for the first time that you're going to be working with and mentor them, how do you get a sense of their mental state or main mental capabilities before you start working on that component? It's a great question. I always start 
with a performer the same way, which is getting to know them, um, learning the learner. And part of that is hearing a bit about their journey up until now. Part of it is hearing where they want to go and then getting a glimpse into what seems to be standing in their way. And I always want to listen and learn before I do a lot of talking and say much of anything. But okay. that's the starting place. So now from your experiences of working with these people uh, and getting to know them on a little bit more intimate level, what type of qualities does a person or coach need to possess in order to unlock that person's true potential and get into a position where they can improve their mindset? I think it all starts with awareness. And so I would start with self-awareness. First, I'd like to hear what it is they're already aware of about themselves. Then we might do some things that help hold up a mirror to parts of themselves, either that they forgot, they've been ignoring, or they've tried to avoid looking at. I think um, a coach would be really helpful if they had the ability to connect with another human, the ability to deeply listen so that you can allow people to really feel seen and not sum them up in a way that they think is, God, that's, that's not what I was saying at all. And the ability to keep offerings quite simple. I think if we can take complex things and make them simple, um, it goes a long way to creating the building blocks necessary to go on this kind of journey together. Is there any specific strategies that you would encourage maybe a first time individual who says, you know, I want to improve my self-awareness. I want to improve my ability to build that rapport with the person I'm working with. Is there any initial strategies that you could share with people that might help them get more comfortable in that role? Yeah, I think um, the number one thing we've found is the process of helping people slow down their thoughts. A lot of times people come off of the field, come off of the stage, come off of set, and everything feels like this noisy blur. They don't know exactly what happened. Now, sometimes they don't know what happened because it went well. They were actually so caught up in the moment. They were so immersed in what they were doing. They weren't really in their head. They were just reading and reacting and flowing and playing. But other times the noisy blur is there was a lot of information in there, but I can't really hear it very clearly. And so the first thing we need to do is help people slow down their thoughts. And so the first thing we do is try to build a bit of a reflective process for afterwards, whether that's jotting down thoughts whether it's allowing yourself to just free flow thoughts onto a page or asking specific questions. Sometimes we facilitate that with people and sometimes it's a, a lonely work process that they do on their own. I think the other thing is removing the interferences so that they can see what in their process isn't working any longer. So for example, if you have a lot of mental chatter and you can find a way to turn the knob down on that self-talk, critical brain or the part of us that's trying to you know, guide and correct us along the way. As soon as we can slow down our thoughts and turn down the knob on that, it becomes so much easier to see what is working and what isn't working yet in our technique. And then I think getting really clear on what success would actually look like. I think a lot of people devalue moments that they've had where they've actually experienced feeling like the best version of themselves. Maybe it isn't in the craft they're working in. Maybe it was like at a birthday party. Maybe it was on a date. But I think if we can get super clear on what success looks like, then we can find ways to distill that into a practice and bring the qualities into our work. So those are three things that I would start out with as strategies. How much of a role do you think prior experiences have in a person's ability to develop that mindset? So, you know, whether it be a, a traumatic experience of the past where they tried these things and it didn't work or potentially a very, you know, joyous experience that they think, okay, I can replicate this by staying the same way over and over. So what role does that prior experience play in that role of controlling your mindset? It's such a good question. You know, we've worked with people that are starting out a new craft for the first time and it didn't matter. They had such a strong mental game that even though they were newer at this craft, 
They were so enjoyable to work with. They were so charming. They, they showed up in themselves. And there was a sort of quiet confidence about the way they worked. Now, I think part of what you're hinting at is that if we've had this traumatic experience or things haven't worked out in the past, that can really be a burden as we move forward. It could be something that we worry will happen again, can become part of our identity. So I think the way we would talk about it is that our past informs our present, but it doesn't have to rule it. There was a... There was an MMA fighter that I was working with and she had uh, been a, a world champion MMA fighter and she was making a transition over into working on screen. And one of the first times that we were meeting, before we got to work on the material for the film she was working on, I had some questions because I was trying to learn the learner. And I said, hey, when you go out and you start your fight, is everything all mapped out? Do you know exactly what you're gonna do? And what she said was, uh, you know, no, I only plan the first exchange and everything else is improvised. And I sort of read and react to what I'm being given. And I said to her, hey, that's the perfect metaphor for how to approach a scene. If you try to plan the whole thing out there, you're going to miss a whole lot of information and a chance to play with the person who's right in front of you. And if you come in with nothing, you might be bowled over. But if you can come, on, come in with like a one thought or one exchange or one runway into the material and then take the journey, I think it's gonna be, this process is gonna feel so familiar to you because you're already doing it every time you get up and fight. And it was like a light bulb went off. And from then on, if she wasn't intimidated to go work, even though she was surrounded by these incredible directors and stars. So I think we can, draw parallels to the things we already know how to do well. So there's an example of where our past can really serve us if it's framed right. Now, not to mitigate the seriousness of mental health disorders and the power that that has over people, but is there any way that, you know, people who are in this business of sports psychology or just psychology in general, and who work with the performer's mindset type of uh, tools, is there a way you can help counsel people who might suffer from mental health issues, whether it be you know, depression or, or anything else further than that? What can we do to apply those principles to improve their lives as well? You know, that's, that's one of the most important conversations we find ourselves having, and I'm so glad that you're focused on it. And I wanna be really clear that I am not a licensed psychologist. But my understanding from listening to sports psychologists is that very generally speaking, depression has more to do with the past and anxiety has more to do with the future. So depression has more to do with unresolved processing around a past experience that we are having trouble letting go of or getting over. And anxiety tends to be when we are chronically searching or when we are consistently and chronically searching the future for things that can go wrong. Now, threat, it matters. And, you know, whether we're being chased by a bear, whether we're on a football field or whether we're crossing traffic, you know, with a toddler, the ability to be concerned matters. It's just when we can't shut it off. Now, you and I spoke briefly about this. We both have little ones. I don't know if this happened to you, but when I became a dad, the optimistic, positive person that I worked so hard to develop, I found myself almost reflexively worrying about my child's safety. And my brain started going to it before I could even rationally understand why. And so there's this thing that happens in the body called anticipatory stress. And anticipatory stress is when we think about a possible future and we anticipate what might go into it, and we feel stress. And the problem is, is that if we constantly do that and we don't downregulate, then it can become this low hum where it's impossible to switch off and our body just can't switch into any other gear. And when that becomes a consistent cycle and we don't find those moments to interrupt that pattern, that becomes chronic anxiety or general anxiety disorder. And so we really need to switch off. We really need to activate the parasympathetic nervous system. We really need to let our bodies know that we are safe. So whether it's dealing with the past or whether it's dealing with the future, one of the main ways we can do that is by coming back to right now. 
So if we can come back to this moment and recognize that in most likelihood, in this moment, I am safe. In this moment, there is enough inside me to deal with whatever's coming up. That can be incredibly powerful, whether it's a breath technique or a phrase we say to ourselves or some other way that we reset. Some people use a rubber band on their wrist. But I think the idea is being able to come back to now. And the other thing is with regards to depression, there's incredible work being done by the Nagoski sisters um, one of them is a world-class musician. The other one is a research scientist. And they recently went on Brene Brown's, Brene Brown's podcast. And uh, they were talking to her about completing the stress cycle. And so this, there's this idea that's now scientifically based, which is that um, when we go through something disappointing, when we go through something that is um, really uncomfortable or potentially traumatic, there is a beginning, middle, and end to the cycle of stress in regards to that event. And if we can go through it, it's like going through a tunnel. And if we can go all the way through the tunnel, it will resolve. Now, there's a difference between the stress that builds up in our body and the stressor. If the stressor continues, then we might fill up with stress again and have to deal with that stress. But if we complete the cycle, there is no longer the necessity for stress to be in our body and it doesn't necessarily get stored in places in our body, and it doesn't metastasize and stick around and potentially hijack all the hormones that are you know, supposed to be helping our immune system or helping us focus or helping us perform. So there's a lot of great science that we can lean into to help us complete the stress cycle, and that will have an impact on the, the rocks that we're carrying in our backpack from the past. Now, kind of shifting gears a little bit, but still tying things in a little bit to what we've been talking about so far. Let's talk about roles. So like you've obviously been in various roles throughout your career, and sometimes those roles are predetermined for you. Sometimes there's improvisation like you've talked about. How much should roles define interactions with people? So in terms of we have coaches who listen to this podcast, and their role is sometimes defined in a job description. Sometimes they take on additional roles um, in their young athletes' lives. So in from you know, a leadership perspective, how much should a role define an interaction? Let me, I think I understand where this is going. So let me start to speak to it. And if I, if I miss something, you know, help me out. So one of the things that I really feel fortunate about is that I've had so many different perspectives on the craft that I'm in. I've been an actor in a room. I've been a reader in the casting department. I have been a director searching for actors. I have been the writer. Uh, I've been the producer. I've been in all these different roles. And as a result, I've also been on set in so many different ways, right? Like I've been the voice of Garfield on the Garfield feature and living between two worlds where I was partly in the cast, but I wasn't on screen. And then I was partly in the crew. And I feel like so much of what we value in mindset is cross training our perspectives, meaning being able to put ourselves into the shoes of another person, not just to cultivate empathy, not just to deepen our understanding of what our job is, which can help us release what isn't our job. But there's something really powerful about that cross perspective. So I would imagine that in the same way there are shows like Undercover Boss, where the head of a company comes and goes and works back in a sort of more menial role and realizes what the culture of the company looks like from that perspective, we can probably do this either experientially or using our imagination. And I think when we do this, if we have a, a clear structure on what we're searching for from those different perspectives, it can really empower us as we move through being more effective communicators, leaders, coaches, et cetera. Does that start to speak to your question? That's exactly what I was looking to hear for. So appreciate that answer. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> now, Joe, as we start wrapping things up here, if you had one piece of advice for coaches, athletes, anybody who's listening to this podcast, and you had to give them one piece of advice either to live by or just something to improve their life today, what would that piece of advice be and why? I mean... I think if we boil it all down, it would be seek mistakes because it means you're really going for it. Because if we go for it and risk, 
then it's inevitable that some things are going to go well and some things we're not going to be able to handle yet. We're going to make mistakes. And when we make mistakes, then we can learn. And when we learn, we can grow. And I think we have to make a decision every time we get up to do what we're here to do, what we're interested in doing. Are we trying to get better? Are we trying to prove to other people or prove to ourselves how good we already are? Because those are two fundamentally different mindsets. And to me, I value growth every time. Now, Joe, for those listeners who want to learn more about the performer's mindset and all the other things that you guys are, are doing with your platform, where can they find more information? Uh, it's really kind of you. Um, our website is theperformersmindset.com. We're at the Performers Mindset on Instagram. Uh, you can reach out to us on any of those platforms and we're happy to continue the conversation. Um, but really, you know, wherever we meet, in virtual space, in real life, you know, we're really excited and we're really looking forward to hearing how any of these little things we talked about today may spark something in you or, you know, get you curious about something. So reach out to us. We want to hear from you. We'd love to hear uh, what you think.